<laughs> Thank you, that was great. <laughs> Thank Hello everyone. I am very excited to be here with you all today. It's actually my first talk other than for our own conference in three years, so it is a special moment indeed. It's so wonderful to be with you. I thought I'd kick start today with a couple of questions for you all. So, firstly, raise your hand if you are currently working at a startup. Well, we've got quite a few hands in the audience. Okay, raise your hand if you are currently starting a startup. Quite a few also. And are you thinking about joining one? A few, excellent. Okay, or are you just a little curious and none of that currently applies? few people, a few journalists in particular, I think. <laughs> so I was having a chat with Joel and he said, the creative director of Blackbird, and he said, the key goal of today is to instill a sense of optimism and hope and provoke and challenge. So I certainly hope I can do that a little in the next 10 minutes. So I was thinking, what have I learned and how can I help? I've been doing this Canva thing now for 10 odd years. And it has been absolutely filled with ups, where things feel like they're going extraordinarily well, and downs, where it doesn't feel like anything is on track. It has been full of roundabouts that take a long time to go through. Feels like sometimes you're going backwards, and sometimes you're making a little bit of progress, and then you get to a dead end, and you're like, which, which way am I going to go? And then you kind of go round in circles, over and over and over again, not quite knowing where to go. And then you get to the end and you're like, hmm, have I made any progress at all? And then you look back 10 years later and you're like, yeah, kind of have. <laughs> so just 10 years ago, our whole company could fit around a one room. We could have lunch together around one table. We could sit in one boardroom. And now we've got 3,500 people, 3,300 people all around the globe. We've gone from just a few people using our product to now 100 million people using Canva every single month. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and for, very fortunately, we have a lot of pointy graphs that have continued to keep growing. And so back to the question, what have I learned and how can I help? I think there's three things that really stand out over the journey that I would love every startup to be thinking about and helping to navigate the journey. So one, the importance of dreaming. Two, turning that dream into missions and goals. And three, clearly defining your company values to help guide decisions. So let's kick start it with the importance of dreaming. So there's two very, very different ways of planning. One, is building with what you have in front of you. And it may just be a couple of bricks in sand. You can't build that much necessarily with just a couple of bricks. Maybe a very good looking wall. <laughs> the other way, <laughs> and it might be laughed at, and apparently this is the Gen Z lol emoji. <laughs> it's something many people stopped doing when they were kids. It's something that can be considered too naive, too optimistic, and that is dreaming first. So imagining the amazing castle on the clouds, completely impossible, but you believe that is the perfect future that you would like to get to. Dreaming about the world that you believe should be, could be, or in fact ought to be. The products that you wish existed. The future of industries that you'd like to appear over the years to come. When I think about the future, I have an incredibly optimistic view. I always like to think the future is kinder, the future is friendlier, the future is more efficient, and very importantly, the future is more egalitarian. Years ago, fast, backtrack 11, 12 years ago, even more, gosh, getting old. <laughs> the future, and I was thinking about the future of design. I put together some mocks of what I believe the future of design would be, and they are incredibly embarrassing, but I thought I'd share them with you all here today. And it was actually before Canva was even called Canva. At this awkward point in time, it was called Canvas Chef. <laughs> so, Canvas Chef. 
<laughs> is design, collaboration, and sharing. I really took, see the three little uh, spoons, collaboration really happening there. Um, and then I took the food analogy way too far. So what do you want to chef up? <laughs> Uh, you can chef up anything you like. You can chef up a brochure, and then you can choose any brochure that you like, and then you can choose the base, and you can search for whatever it is that you want and drag it onto the page. You can choose a layout. You can choose photos, and you could get any photo that you possibly like. And then, of course, you can finish it up with some toppings. <laughs> I really took the food analogy too far, but hey, you get the idea. You've got all these amazing pre-prepared ingredients that you can just throw into the pan and make something amazing, even if you aren't a chef. <laughs> so then you can share your design, and you can get it professionally printed and delivered to your door, or you can turn it into a web link, and then you can turn it into a website with just a click of a button. And then, of course, you'd have the brand identity at the center of all this, so you'd be able to easily have your brand across all of these different materials. Thought this was a pretty cool idea. Investors didn't, got lots of rejections. But the truth is, if you don't dream about the future, you can't make it happen. Even if it does feel naive and overly optimistic and a little embarrassing, it's really important to dream first, because literally, that's the only way to start something. And then 10 years later, we launched the Visual Work Suite, and you can print, and you can create a website with a click of a button, and you can empower, be empowered to design very simply across the entire globe. Sometimes it is hard to get out of the weeds. There's so much noise, there's so many things grabbing your attention. But I believe it's really important to go macro, to macro out. And so here are some questions I like to think about quite a lot, and we do so with our team. What will your industry look like in 10 years? This was a question I thought about a lot 10 years ago, because at that point in time, I had no idea if we could lead the industry, but actually just thinking about the industry, being bold in your dreams. What does the future of transportation look like? What does the future of communication look like, or work, or in our case, design, look like in 10 years? And really think about that a lot, and get so convinced that that is the only possible way that the future is going to be. Can you build it? No idea. But that is what you believe the future will be in 10 years' time. And then what? Then taking it back to yourself a little, what would wild success look like in 10 years' time? So we do this exercise with our team all the time, dreaming about the future. What would wild success look like for our entire company? What would it look like for a particular group? What would it look like for a particular team? And then the inverse, which is actually very important as well, is what would terrible failure look like in 10 years? Because sometimes it can help you to think about the risks or the things that you don't want to be as a company as well. So once you have your wild dreams that you believe are so important that it's absolutely going to be the future of your industry, it's really important to turn that dream into missions and goals. So what you don't want to have is a small mission. So you kind of like get to the top of the ladder and you're like, oh, what now? I had no idea. <laughs> you also don't want to have such a wild dream that you don't take any steps towards it. What you want to do is have the perfect balance where you have a wild dream and then you just take step after step after step after step in order to get there. So a mission is where you want to go in the long run. And a goal, I believe, is an important step towards that mission. Goals have been part of our DNA at Canva for many years. In fact, one of our values is to set crazy big goals and make them happen. We've stuck them on the wall when our entire company could look at that one single wall. We have painted them. We've celebrated when we've achieved them. So let me give you an example. So our mission, to empower the world to design. In order to do so, it's rather important that we are in every language. But when we launched in 2013, we launched just in English. But then, that was goal one. The next one, we're going to launch in Spanish. The next one, we're going to launch in 20 languages, and then we did. We set the next goal, launch in 100 languages, and then we did. Then we were launching in hard languages, like Chinese and right to left languages, like Arabic and Hebrew and Urdu. And then we wanted to have a truly localized experience and then become truly local. And you can see how just every year after year, we pick off goals towards that mission. And now Canva is made up, non-English markets make up more than 50% of Canva's community. I'll give you another example. So to empower the world to design, it's really important to be able to be on every device. And so 
we launched Canva just on web. That was all we could do for our very first launch. And then we launched on iPad. And then we launched on iPhone. And then Android. And then tablet. And then we, got, we had a huge focus for two years on cross-platform parity. And then we launched our desktop app. And now 50% of our community is on mobile. So you can see how just continuously picking off goal after goal towards your mission after a decade pays really big dividends. Another part of our mission, to empower the world to design, we need to empower them to design anything. All the way back, even before Canvas Chef, <laughs> we were doing Fusion Books, my first company, which is an online design system to create school yearbooks. So we picked off the very first thing, and just over the years and years and years and years and years, now you can pretty much design anything on Canva, but we actually always, as a company, are continuously thinking about what else could you design? And we mean that quite literally. And there's so much more for us to be doing over in that over the years to come. I think this can be a little underrated. It's not very flashy, consistently working towards your mission, picking off goal after goal, year after year. But breaking it down into tiny steps, and the first step can be really, really tiny. Eventually, if you continue to pursue that year after year, eventually, you'll hopefully get somewhere pretty cool. So, the third part is clearly defining your company values to help guide decisions. So why create values? Are they just something to look pretty on a wall? I certainly don't believe so, and if they are, it's totally mis misusing them. So, when we were just a small team, everyone could chat every day. Everyone knew why we were, what we were doing and why we were doing it and what we valued as a company. But as we've got bigger, it's been really important to solidify our values. Thousands of decisions are being made every single day, probably hundreds of thousands of decisions. And if people think that the only goal of your company is, to, is the bottom line, then it means that people won't be thinking about and creating decisions in the way that you would like. And it's really important that everyone knows the types of decisions that we as a company will support. We wanted our values to apply to our team, our products, and the Canva community. And so we asked our team what they loved and appreciated about our team culture and what they wanted to preserve as we grew. We had lots of great responses. And eventually, after a lot of refinement and a lot of workshops, we landed on six values that we believed were critically important. One, being a force for good, pursuing excellence, making complex things simple, empowering others, setting crazy big goals and making them happen, and being a good human. Without these values, all of the other work that we do wouldn't matter. They're truly foundational to every single thing that we're doing as a company. And it's been incredible seeing our team bring these values to life in so many different ways, at a company level, at a team level, and at an individual level as well. I guess why I care so deeply about this is that I truly believe that businesses should be so much more than just making profit. Businesses can and should be champions for change. Businesses deeply affect the live, lives of their team and their customers. And businesses actually create the world that we live in. There is so much value instilled in the businesses that we touch and use and see and are um, with every single day. So I guess my hope for Australian startups is that we lead the world but not just the world of, of startups. I hope that we solve real problems that affect real people in this little planet of ours. I hope we create startups that promote equality, that create equality. I hope that our startups are values-driven and mission-led. And I truly hope that our startups help to create the world that we all want to live in over the decades to come. It is a crazy big goal, but I believe together we can make it happen. So yes, startups are full of ups and downs and roundabouts, but I hope the tools that we've talked about today might provide a little bit glimmer of hope and help you navigate a little bit easier. So the importance of dreaming, turning that dream into missions and goals, and clearly defining your company values to guide decisions. It is a hell of a journey, but it is a lot of fun. Thank you very much, everyone.
Next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the CEO of the Tech Council of Australia, Kate Pounder. And she's going to join us for a uh, chat up here. Hello. Hi. So, Kate, you're, you're quizzing us, but I'm going to quiz you first. Tell us about the Tech Council of Australia. Tell us about the work that you do. Well, I usually say I think I have the best job in the room, but I'm not usually sitting on the stage with people like Rick and Mel. But the Tech Council of Australia is the peak body for the tech sector, and it's basically our job to celebrate the success of everything we build and to help make that job easier by getting the policies in place that help us innovate, that help us get funding, that help us create jobs. Uh, but also to tell the story to Australians so they understand the benefit to the community of what you guys are doing and they see how it impacts their lives. So um, you're, our, you're our chief storyteller. Chief storyteller. Occasionally advocate, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, but I'm here today to hear about your story and explore that a bit with you both. And, you know, you mentioned, Rick, the first time that you and Mel met on the banks of the Swan River when you each shared your dreams. And my first question is, how do you find the courage when you're meeting someone for the first time to tell them about this big, powerful, personal vision that you're not sure if it's going to come true or not? Would you like to start, Will? Kick it off. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The, uh, like, role model of I courage. Think there's a, a role, role model of courage, exactly. <laughs> I think there is this sort of vulnerability. There's this moment, and, I, and I'm sure many in the, in the room have had it, where... You've been thinking about this idea, it's been locked in your mind for so long. Uh, and there's this, this moment when you sort of let it out into the world and, and you tell someone about it for the first time. And I think that is a real moment of vulnerability because suddenly you sort of put yourself a little bit on the line of, are you actually going to do that or not? Are you going to have the courage to, to actually do it? Um, and so, look, I think, um, I think firstly, we, we bonded sitting on the side of the river because neither of us wanted to go um, wakeboarding or whatever it was, and we decided we'd much rather just sit on this uh, sort of old park bench and, and have a chat. Um, and there, I think there was something special about the fact that we both wanted to, we both had a dream, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's funny thinking back to that, just how big both of our dreams were at that point in time and how completely unplausible either of them were. <laughs> um, and to now be sitting here, um, and actually a lot of that dream has started to come to reality, yeah. uh, which is pretty damn cool. Yeah. Over the years, we've got a workshop that we um, do at Canva, which is that um, of, it's called Taking Things from Chaos to Clarity. And so things start off as like a philosophy, like just in your mind, um, something that you know, might just be completely you know, the castle on the cloud, something completely impossible. And then as soon as you write it down, it starts to add a little bit more clarity. As soon as you start to tell someone, as soon as you start to create mock-ups, it starts to take it on that chaos to clarity journey until it's then in people's hands. And so I think with a dream, as soon as you can like, add a little clarity to it, t tell someone else about it, um, it can get some more and more and more clarity um, until then everyone else can see and feel and experience it. Yeah, there's that moment where it becomes real, right? Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's very special. Yeah. And you each had different dreams. That's the interesting thing, but they were really complementary. Like, if you look back to that moment, do you think either of you would be here today if the other wasn't simultaneously pursuing their vision? And how important do you think it is to have those fellow dreamers, particularly, you know, in an ecosystem like this? I, you know, it's, it's so important. Um, so just on, on our journey in... in you know, for Blackbird, uh, back when we started Blackbird, it was this contrarian idea that you could do venture capital from Australia successfully. There were most people thought that that was something that happened in Silicon Valley, maybe happened in Israel, but didn't happen in Australia. And actually, it was, a, I think, a really bonding moment for Nikki and I when we came together and decided to, to do Blackbird. It was kind of us raging against the world. That was kind of a cool feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure you, you know, many in this room have had that same feeling, you know, whether it's you know, I'm building a rocket from Australia or I'm you know, going to build the next uh, you know, huge platform from Australia. Uh, that, you know, there's still this sort of um, moment where, you, where you, it's you against the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really bonding experience. It's pretty cool. And, then it's so important to, to bring people along the journey with you. And I, you know, I think that um, is something we spend a lot of time talking and looking for in founders. It's not just 
someone who's dreamt up an idea in their bedroom, but someone who's been actually able to start bringing a community of people on the journey with them. Um, you know, I think that's bringing people on the journey is so special, right, and so important. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the thing is, like, you'll get so much rejection, so many people that don't believe it and don't see it, because everyone likes a different, on the chaos to clarity spectrum, everyone likes a different part of the journey. Some people can hear an idea and they love it, and they can understand it. That Rick happens to be one of those people. <laughs> the other people need to see pointy graphs. We have pointy graphs now, but we didn't have them at the time. But people, who, so finding people that understand and uh, can get around the part of the journey that you're on. So when it wasn't just a philosophy or just an idea um, or just a dream, there's, the only, there's a very special type of person that understands a con concept at that point in time. I think as you get more and more pointy graphs, <laughs> um, it, it, things change and more and more people can start to understand and see what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and so finding the people that understand what you're trying to do and then can help will it into existence is so incredibly important. And, and do you think? I mean, I used to have this rule that if I wanted to try and do something and a lot of people started telling me there was no way to do it, that was an amazing sign. Because that <laughs> meant if I thought I could see a pathway and I did it, it would be really cool, right? And then do you, do you think you need to find founders who have that sense of being galvanised by the dream and galvanised by the challenge and that gives you a, a sense of courage? I like that. Personally, I found it extraordinarily frustrating. <laughs> um, I, I was like so convinced this is the future, and I was like, why is everyone just saying no and not understanding it? Um, and it was because it, it was a number of years of yeah. that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, I, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with the fact that um, you have to be so committed and so much wanting to will this into existence, and so so believing it's the future. Like I, you know, I think that was an important thing. This is the future. This is what's happening. It's the question was just whether or not I could do that or whether mm. or not we could do that. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? How many, how many no's did you get <laughs> when you first started pitching oh. Canvas Chef? Well, it was Canva by then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, I think well, you, we met when it was already Canva. Or? No, it was Canvas Chef. I, I saw that presentation. So awkward name. Awkward name. <laughs> I saw that presentation. Can, like the haircut Canva in Chef. the 90s. I, I remember <laughs> you and Cliff coming and having a coffee with me in Sydney and saying, hey, we just bought this, this um, domain name. Oh, you told me it was cheesy. Canva. <laughs> I was like, oh, Canva. I, I think I told you Canvas Chef was cheap. Yeah, Canvas Chef. Hopefully, was good. yeah. No, Canvas was good. And it's Canva, 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 and it just—it was a funny word, and it was sort of a bit strange. And it's funny how that word has become so such a beautiful word now. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. That, like the number of people that you have to say Canvas without like, Canva is Canvas without the S. That's <laughs> starting to change, like a, oh, quite quite a lot comparatively to the, those early years. How many no's did you get? Do you reckon? Oh, uh, actually, uh, yeah. Well, more than a hundred. <laughs> it was it was a bit. <laughs> but then also that was from investors and then trying yeah. to find team members to join. So like it, trying to find engineers and trying to find engineers that passed Lars, like Lars who um, co-founded Google Maps. He was our tech advisor and we had to find someone that was up to his standard. So that was just like getting rejection just all <laughs> over the shop. It was, yeah, so it was a little frustrating, but worthwhile because it meant that we refined our pitch deck, it meant that we ended up with the best people on our tech team that actually had the capability to build this crazy platform that we were dreaming up. So even though it was frustrating, I think in retrospect it was very valuable um, because we just got so much better and refined in our pitch deck and strategy. And how do you, and I'm going to quote Kenny Rogers here, so, <laughs> the gambler, how do you know when to hold them and when to fold them when you're in that situation? Because on the one hand, you want to hold on to that dream and you have that unerring belief, but if you've got these advisors around you, maybe they're going like, Canva, give it some thought. You know, how do you know which ones to hold, which ones to fold? I think it's not an easy answer. It's, it's more of an art than a science, I would say, but I think... Um, what do they say? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So I'm not suggesting that you just do the same thing over and over again. You just try lots of different tactics to get to the same goal. And so we tried lots of different tactics for many years. Um, and every time we got a rejection, we'd go and refine our pitch deck. Every time we got you know, 
someone that didn't understand something. Could, I don't understand the design industry. How can, um, you, why, why would you want a design program for non-designers? That makes no sense. <laughs> uh, how big can that market get? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So every time we got that, we'd go and refine the pitch deck and refine the strategy. Um, and yeah, it definitely was challenging. I love it that. sounds how like you nailed it. Yeah. I love that. How big can the market get? I remember. I yeah. actually remember going to see a US VC when we just made the investment into Canva and talking about. I think you might have been thinking about your next round and talking to them about Canva, and they were just like, "No, I don't get it. The market. The market's not there. No, I don't. Why does everyone want to do you that?" You know what the, the hilarious thing is? People, investors, typically reject you in email form. So I actually have all of the emails of people <laughs> saying the market's not big enough. Like. Just, all of these quite hilarious <laughs> comments. One day you can press re reply. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon maybe, maybe that would be okay. Reply, reply. <laughs> it <could> give investors <laughs> some you know, food for thought as well, right? They know that Mel Perkins okay. has got this, this bank of emails. But yeah. one, <laughs> one last question for you. Um, you know, Rick, you talked about the potential of Australia. And Mel, you talked about the importance of having a wild dream 10 years ahead. So what's your one big wild dream for the Australian tech sector and how do we do it together? I would love Australia to not just be creating startups in the image of other countries. I really believe that we have a unique opportunity to create world-leading companies that are values-driven, mission-led, that really are solving real problems. I think that a lot of the world gets forgotten about in the world of startups, and it's very often that startups are being created for like a very small, um, small percent of the people on this planet. And I think there's so much that can be created, so much value that can be created when you're thinking about the whole world and you're thinking about the needs of everyone here and all of those billions and trillions of dollars is actually flowing to make the world an actually better place. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my hope, is that Australia can become synonymous with startups that are actually helping to shape the world that we want. Can you match it? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I know, I was thinking of it, you know, am I going to say, you know, when the top 10 businesses in Australia are tech companies, but that sounds uh, too, too money focused. <laughs> wonderful thing. Um, and of course, you know, um, money. That too, they're not, they're not uh, antagonistic to <laughs> each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, wealth generation is, is, a, is a only one scorecard of, of what is a wonderful thing. Look, I, I think we've, we've um, you know, in a, in a, decade or so since this conference started, um, the community has really come together and there's this, like, there's this framework, there's all the different pieces of the puzzle that we need to create startups over and over again. So I think it's that moment where Canva is not a sort of wild stand on its own sort of thing, but there's a whole group and a whole cohort of these companies growing up together and I think it's, it's already kind of starting at the moment. Um, there are now thousands of companies all growing up together. And that, that, that is the dream. Well, I think it's a pretty good one. So let's set a mission. Let's set some goals and make it happen. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you.